Continuing our reading in The World in Thorin by Damon Knight. Today is chapter 4, section 1. How Thorin roasted two fat waterfowl for his dinner, and what happened thereafter. Thorin sat perched on a rock, chin in his hands, staring down at the smooth glassy curve of the water, where it disappeared under the overhang. The voice in his head was a remote murmur, as steady and insistent as the water itself. The rocks below him were black and glistening with spray. The water made a subdued rushing sound, so constant and pervasive that it was like the sound of blood in his own veins. Twigs, then a broad leaf, rode down the shining back of the river, curving under and shot abruptly out of sight. He must go down, but he could not. In three days he had followed the river from the western end of the valley, where it fell in a graceful cataract straight down the face of the mountain to its exit here at the eastern end. He had crossed the river at the shallows, half a league above, and had followed the wall of mountains all the way around the valley. They were the same everywhere, sheer gray rock, unbroken, without a fissure, a ledge, a handhold. The mountains pierced the sky, or else the sky severed the mountains. There was no exit from the valley except for the chasm into which the river fell. The sky was dimming. It was time to think of supper, and then a place to sleep. He knew what he had tried so long to keep from knowing. The mountains were not mountains, but walls of rock. The sky, not a sky, but a roof of a cavern. A fool might have known as much, for he had traveled steadily downward from the midworld. But who could have believed that there were trees, a river, a sky, underground? He went into the forest and picked fruit, but the sight and smell of it made his stomach knot and he threw it into the bushes. Thinking of the waterfowl that nested along the river bank, he turned with sudden resolution. If nothing else, he could at least hunt his own food and have a meal fit to eat. The river was witchily green, with reflected skylight among the dark tussles. Waiting, he moved with caution, stopping at every step to listen. A rustle from the clump ahead, as he plunged toward it, he heard a sleepy note and saw a crested head appear. He got his hands on the warm feathered neck and wrung it, cutting off the bird's sudden squawk. Another body thrashed up from the grass, wings flapped. He lunged, got that one too. With the plump body slung over his shoulder, he waded ashore. Just as he reached the bank, the night raced overhead and the world fell into breathing blackness. He searched the forest for fallen limbs, tore them loose from the vines that clung to them with a thousand suckers, and kindled a fire on the greensward, not far from the pod vines. He plucked and claimed his two fowl. One was a cock, the other a young hen, then contrived a spit between two forked branches thrust into the ground, skewered the birds on it, and roasted them over the fire. A faint pattering began around him. A cool drop struck his nose. Thorin got a big leaf from the forest to cover the spit, and another for himself. In the ruddy light, the greensward was another place, walled in by darkness. Raindrops bombarded his leaves and rebounded, pale in the firelight. The crisp skin curled, wept grease that sizzled in the flames. The smell that came from it made his mouth fill with water, and he ate the first fowl with raging appetite before it was properly cooled enough. Nothing had ever tasted so good. He carried the second bird into the shelter of a tree and ate a leg and a breast of it. Then weariness overcame him. He dropped the rest and stretched himself out. Rain rattled in the leaves high overhead, beyond the lower branches, in the faint glow of the fire. He saw it steaming, coppery against the black air. He was up at first light, washed in the river, then breakfasted on the remains of the second bird. Lazy and replete, he lay down and dozed again. Sometime later, he woke with a start. Half a dozen of the older children were staring at him across the ashes of his fire. 
and the little heap of feathers, bones, and offal. Among them were the girl he had spoken to, or one like her. Their faces were white. Questioning voices came from behind him. More people were emerging from the forest. The children turned and ran toward them, screaming as they went. A crowd formed around the children. It grew momentarily larger and noisier. Thorin saw faces turned toward him, staring eyes, open mouths. Bewildered, he got up, but already the people were turning away. Their voices dwindled. The whole crowd was moving back into the forest. The last of them disappeared. When he awoke the next morning, the presents he had given them lay in a little heap at his side, pebbles, crystal, weasel skull, scrap of cloth. And that's the end of section one.